Let's continue with Peter Atiyah's Outlive, this being the fifth part of our interpretation. Cancer is a hot topic, but I believe you will still get a lot out of this book about cancer. Cancer is an immense challenge. Even though Atiyah maintains an overall optimistic tone in his book, he acknowledges that, in our lifetime, a complete cure or prevention for cancer is highly unlikely without a miraculous breakthrough. However, it's not entirely bleak, and there are actions we can take. Cancer, to me, represents a profound intellectual challenge. It's complex, mysterious, and fascinating. Among the four horsemen, cancer is the most difficult to prevent, because the exact causes are unknown, and the underlying mechanisms remain unclear. Using scientific statistical methods, modern medicine only knows what increases the likelihood of cancer. For instance, the causal link between smoking and lung cancer is solid, and we understand that insulin resistance and obesity significantly increase cancer risk. Pollution in air and water is also linked to higher cancer probabilities, although the data in this regard is less clear. As for claims about specific foods causing or preventing cancer in daily life, the effects are generally inconspicuous. The key point is that even if you don't smoke, maintain normal insulin levels, avoid obesity, live in a pollution-free area, eat healthily, practice calligraphy with a joyful heart all day, your chances of getting cancer won't decrease significantly. Living beyond the age of 70, there's still a 20% chance of developing cancer, even if you're otherwise healthy. One could say that cancer is a disease that occurs inexplicably. A fate predetermined in the depths of human cell biology. Cancer remains a mystery. Let's start with some basic facts. What is cancer? Simply put, cancer is the uncontrollable growth of cells in places where they shouldn't grow, forming tumors. Cancer cells have two distinct characteristics that define cancer. The first is that cancer cells don't stop growing when they should. Many think cancer cells grow rapidly, but that's not necessarily true. The growth rate of cancer cells isn't faster than normal cells. They just refuse to stop. Normal cells stop growing or dividing when signaled by the body, but cancer cells do not. The reasons behind this behavior remain unknown, possibly due to random genetic mutations. The second characteristic is that cancer cells can migrate from one part of the body to a distant location, even spreading to many sites. Normal cells cannot travel that far. If cancer cells don't spread, many cancers are not fatal. Removing the tumor through surgery may be sufficient. Breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, and colorectal cancer, even if you remove the affected organ, might not be lethal. When someone is reported to have died from breast or prostate cancer, it often means that cancer has already metastasized to more critical, irremovable parts, such as the lungs, brain, liver, or bones. If cancer has metastasized, the 10-year survival rate, even 50 years ago, was zero, and it remains zero today. In modern medicine, the standard is if you can extend survival by five years, it's considered a successful treatment. So, most cancer treatments and research now focus on metastatic cancers. Once cancer spreads, relying solely on surgery is no longer effective. Cancer becomes a systemic problem, requiring systematic treatments, often involving chemotherapy. Chemotherapy can kill cancer cells on a large scale, but the problem is that it also kills normal cells, causing significant harm and suffering to patients. Moreover, chemotherapy doesn't eradicate all cancer cells. Some survive, mutate, much like bacteria developing resistance to antibiotics, and eventually, the cancer returns. This is why metastatic cancer is essentially incurable. Now, you might ask, why do cancer cells spread? We don't know. And, cynically put by Atiyah, we may not find the answer anytime soon, because only 5% to 8% of cancer research funding in the U.S. is allocated to studying the spread of cancer cells. But that's not the most challenging part of the problem. If cancer had a common mechanism, spending more time might eventually uncover it. However, aside from the shared characteristics of not stopping growth, when they should and easily spreading, there's little similarity between different cancers. Cancer is not a single disease, but a collective term for many diseases. Breast cancer and pancreatic cancer are entirely different, and every cancer is distinct. This means you can't treat all cancers with one drug or therapy. 
so, you might wonder if there's a more straightforward approach. If cancer is caused by genetic mutations, why not invest more effort and resources into identifying all the mutations associated with all types of cancer? The National Cancer Institute in the U.S. started a massive project in 2006 called the Cancer Genome Atlas, analyzing the genetic conditions of many cancers. The results, however, complicated matters. Each cancer is associated with at least over a hundred different gene mutations, and the mutation process appears entirely random. It's like a championship-winning sports team suddenly losing its abilities. Why? Numerous reasons. Just as happy normal cells are similar, unfortunate cancer cells each have their unique misfortunes. Perhaps the cells randomly acquired mutations, genes became chaotic, and they turned into cancer cells. The question is, how did these mutated cells acquire the superpowers of continuous growth and spreading? No one knows. This situation means that not only do the genes of breast cancer cells differ from those of colon cancer cells, but even within breast cancer, different types have different genetic characteristics. Breast cancer comes in several varieties, and a targeted drug that works for one person's breast cancer may be ineffective for another. It gets more challenging. With over $100 billion in funding from the National Cancer Institute, and additional billions in public donations, millions of papers published, cancer remains the second leading cause of death in the U.S., second only to heart disease. As mentioned in the previous part, since the mid-20th century, the mortality rate from cardiovascular diseases has dropped by two-thirds. However, cancer's mortality rate is nearly the same as it was 50 years ago. Only a few specific cancers have seen relatively effective treatments. For most cancers, there are still no good solutions. Cancer is also a disease that becomes more likely with age. The graph shows that for every 10 years a person lives, the cancer incidence rate doubles. The median age for cancer diagnosis is 66. For individuals aged 45 to 64, where cardiovascular problems haven't reached severe levels, cancer is the leading cause of death. Among this group, more people die from cancer than the combined numbers for heart disease, liver disease, and stroke. Cancer takes the lead. The biggest challenge in treating cancer is often that it's discovered in the late stages. Late-stage tumors are often too large to be surgically removed, and if they have already metastasized, the situation is even more challenging. Modern medicine has reached its limits in surgically treating cancer. Of course, there's progress in medicine, and some new therapies show promising results. One such therapy is targeted drugs. The genomic project is helpful, targeting specific genes in certain cancers, and some targeted drugs have proven effective. However, Atiyah doesn't delve much into this. His focus is on immunotherapy. Immunotherapy involves leveraging the body's immune system to kill cancer cells. In history, there have been cases where seriously ill cancer patients, without any special treatment, seemingly recovered miraculously, possibly due to infection with a particular bacterium that activated their immune systems. This brought endless hope to researchers. So, you might wonder, can we deliberately infect a patient with a certain bacterium to activate their immune system and cure cancer? Doctors have been attempting this for a long time, with minimal success. Until recently. Skipping the specific details, let's focus on the strategic issue. A currently popular method is called CAR-T. Here, it's crucial to note that while immunotherapy can be highly effective, the success rate is low. Only one-third of cancers can be treated with immunotherapy and among those treatable cancers, only one quarter of patients truly benefit. Why some people don't respond? You guessed it. It's likely due to genetic reasons. But the significant advantage of immunotherapy is that once it works, it can cure the disease without rebounding. It can make the cancer cells disappear. Studies indicate that if immunotherapy works entirely, 80% to 90% of patients still show no recurrence after 15 years. This is entirely different from chemotherapy, which cannot kill cancer cells. There are other therapies, like metabolic therapy, but we won't go into details here. Typically, strategies are combined with chemotherapy. Currently, immunotherapy seems to be the most hopeful and effective approach. However, the truly best method is early detection for early treatment. 
In the early stages of cancer, when the number of cancer cells is low, tumors are small, and there's no metastasis, treatment is more manageable, and even immunotherapy is more likely to be effective. So, early screening is essential. But here's the old problem again. There are dozens of types of cancer. Out of these various types, only five have recognized, reliable screening methods. These are lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, and cervical cancer. Some medical checkups now include screening for these cancers. However, screening has an issue of false positives, where you're mistakenly believed to have cancer when you don't. Aside from the scare, if treatment is initiated, it's both costly and physically demanding. Furthermore, even if you avoid these five cancers, there are still others that screening may not detect. Atia, nevertheless, advocates aggressively screening for cancer, because he believes the benefits outweigh the risks. Especially for colorectal cancer, which is easily detectable, the returns are substantial. The ideal direction is blood tests. When there are cancer cells in the body, there are indeed some traces in the blood. Cancer cells have their unique DNA fragments, and if you can detect those fragments in the blood, you found cancer, right? It sounds easy, but don't forget. There's no consistent genetic feature for any type of cancer. The most feasible method now is, for example, if someone has a tumor removed through surgery, we can extract the genetic characteristics of that specific cancer cell from the tumor. Then, in subsequent blood tests, we look for DNA fragments with those characteristics to determine if the cancer has recurred. But even this is challenging because blood contains various cell-free DNAs. Only one in a thousand or one in a hundred thousand may be from cancer. You can imagine how difficult blood screening is. Currently, a prominent company in blood screening is called Grail, which uses AI to assist in sample analysis. It has made some positive progress, but it's far from claiming mature technology. In conclusion, we don't know why cancer cells resist stopping growth and spreading. Each type of cancer, even different subtypes of the same cancer, is unique. Cancer lacks simple genetic features. Despite these challenges, modern medicine has made some progress. For doctors, the focus is on metastatic cancer, with immunotherapy offering the most significant hope. For patients, the best strategy is early screening, early detection, and early treatment. Humanity has been saying for decades that we'll conquer cancer. Yet, after countless researchers dedicating themselves, cancer proves to be more complex than we imagined. Perhaps our technological conditions haven't reached the level required to conquer cancer. But I believe humanity will prevail. If you plan to become a cancer researcher, this section might help you identify the challenges in your research. In the next lecture, we'll discuss Alzheimer's disease. If you feel there is value in this, please like, subscribe to this channel, and leave your thoughts or suggestions in the comments section. Let's grow together and read more good books.